Good morning, everyone. The most beautiful Easter morning. It's great to have you. It's a wonderful day. It's the holiest of holidays. And it's great to have a good crowd. Um, quick announcement. Uh, session meets this week, uh, Thursday at uh, 6. Is there any other announcement that we need to make right now? Deacons next Sunday after church. Anybody else will take the class and I'll start to see. Okay. By the way, thank you all for being here today. I wanted to, it's my honor to introduce Reverend Susan Crummel, who is our who is our pastor for the day. And I look forward to the April pressure. No. Never any pressure. Thank you for the this is wonderful too, so I'll get out of the way and let's get started. Thank you. Please join me in the call to worship. For behold, says the Lord, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. The wolf and the lamb shall graze together. Mine shall be strong like the ox. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountains, says the Lord. Let us Let's worship God, Creator, Redeemer, Sustainer. And let us stand and join together in our first hymn, which is number 232.
Who's on? The rock. The rock. It moved, didn't it? It's huge. Big. Big. It moved. How did they move it?
Thank you for that beautiful answer. Mary got up really early on that first Easter morning 
Maybe some of you got up really early this morning because you had to get the potatoes ready or get the ham in the oven or make the rolls or whatever might have kept you occupied before the sun was even up today. Mary got up that early because she wanted to go to the place where she knew that they had laid Jesus' body. After all, she had been at the foot of the cross. She had seen Joseph of Arimathea ask to be able to take Jesus' body down. She probably followed to be sure that she would know where the grave was because she knew she wanted to come early on this Sunday morning. She couldn't come earlier. She couldn't stay when Jesus' body was first put there because it was the Sabbath day. <coughs> Joseph got the body to this grave close to where Jesus had died quickly before the sun went down on that Friday on the Sabbath so that there would be a respectable place for Jesus' body to rest. But Mary got up very early to go out to be sure she knew where this grave was so that she could always come back. Maybe she had some flowers with her. Maybe like me, some of you visit the grave with flowers in your hands. Maybe she just wanted a quiet moment by herself. After all, Mary was one of the disciples, not one of the 12 men who are named always throughout the Bible, but Mary and some other women were always with Jesus as he traveled she heard what he said. He had healed her from demons. She had seen him heal people. She had seen the miracles that he had performed on behalf of God. She knew as much about Jesus as any of the other disciples knew. And she knew that she now wanted to honor him at his grave, at this place where she never thought she would find herself. So as she walked out there to the cemetery, maybe she was thinking back over the last few days, while she and the other disciples and Jesus had been there in Jerusalem for the last time, maybe she was remembering some of the things that had happened, especially the very surprising things that she had seen just in these last few hours before Jesus' death. She had surely been in that upper room where the male disciples were gathered around the table for that last meal with Jesus because, after all, somebody had to fix the food. But the women would not have been welcomed to the table. They would have been standing maybe in the next room or maybe back in the shadow, listening to what Jesus did as he prayed for all of his disciples, as he shared a meal with all of those disciples there, as we will soon share a meal here. And then she saw what Jesus did that surprised her perhaps the most on that evening. Because she saw Jesus stand up from the table where he and the other disciples were reclining. You know, the way they ate them. It was a low table. They would rest on an elbow. Their feet would be away from the table. She saw him stand up from that table and take a towel that was over at the side of the room that was left there from when the servants had been in the room and others who had served the meal. He took the towel and he wrapped it around his waist after taking his outer clothes off. He dressed himself like a servant. Then he called for a basin of water to be brought. And he said to those gathered around that table, I'm going to wash your feet. The disciples said, oh, no, 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 you're not going to wash my feet. That's something that only a servant does. And we traveled a lot together, and we listened to you. You're our teacher. You're our leader. Some may have even already been calling him their master. You are not our servant. You cannot wash our feet. But Jesus said, unless you let me wash your feet, unless you let me show you what it means to be a servant leader to other people, you cannot have a whole heart in me. And so Mary had watched him, wash the feet of the disciples, and must have been surprised to see Jesus do this. This was out of the ordinary for Jesus. But she shouldn't have been surprised. 
She had heard him say before that to be great, you must be the servant of all. She had watched the way he had interacted with other people whom other rabbis, other religious leaders wouldn't have touched. He had touched people to heal them in a way that would have made him unclean. He had been a servant already to lots and lots of people in his ministry. So she really shouldn't have been surprised. And then she knew that the men had gone out into the garden to pray. She had heard the story of what happened next, that the soldiers came, that Judas, who had been there and had his feet washed, that Judas had gone and got the soldiers and brought them there to the garden where the teacher and the disciples were at prayer. That Jesus had been arrested after saying to them, I'm the one you want, take me, leave these others alone, I will go in their stead. She had heard that Jesus had been taken first to the religious authorities and then to Pilate himself, the Roman who ruled on behalf of the emperor in Galilee and in Judea. She knew that Jesus had stood a fake trial. She was probably standing along the road to watch Jesus bowed under the weight of the crossbar of his own cross as he carried it and stumbled toward Calvary with it. We know that she was standing at the foot of the cross as the soldiers nailed his hands to that crossbar and lifted it up probably with a pulley and affixed it in place and nailed his feet to the cross left him there to suffocate as all people who were crucified eventually did. She stood there and watched and she must have been surprised. After all she had seen Jesus do, after all of the people she had healed, after the miracles she had seen, why wasn't he begging himself off the cross? She must have been surprised. But if she really thought about this is what Jesus had told them all along, that he would die for them, that he would be sacrificed for them, that he would be the Passover lamb in their place. So she shouldn't have been surprised by the horror of what she saw. And then that Sunday morning, just a few hours earlier than we are gathering here in worship today, she went out there to the tomb. You've heard the story now twice with the children, and when I read it, she went out alone. She went back and told the male disciples, um, the stones roll away. I think somebody's stolen Jesus' body. So they raced back out, and she followed them. She saw them look in the tomb and then head back to town. This time, she bent down and looked into the tomb, and in her, she saw two messengers from God who said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Well, they've taken my Lord's body, my teacher's body, my friend's body. I don't know where it is. I came out here to honor him. I don't know what to do. She stepped back out of the tomb, and the way John writes it, it's almost as if she kind of almost bumped into someone. By now, she's crying so hard that she really can't see. She turns toward him and says, Tell me where you've taken it. If you took his body away, tell me where it is. And then she hears a voice that she knows so well. Yeah. It's me. Now, don't touch me because I'm not yet ascended to my father. But go and share the good news. You go, Mary, and tell this good news for the first time that I've been raised from the dead. She must have been surprised about that as well. But she really shouldn't have been surprised because she knew what had happened just a few weeks earlier. She was friends with Mary and Martha and Lazarus. So she would have known that Lazarus had died. He had been in his tomb for four days. He was really Jesus came to that other cemetery with his friends, Mary 
and Martha, who had lost their brother, Lazarus. He also stood in that cemetery and cried, perhaps for himself because he knew what would happen soon, perhaps for his friends who had been sad for these four days. But then he said to those who were standing there, roll the stone away from the tomb. Martha, Lazarus' sister, who was always practical about everything, said, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> He's been dead for four days. We don't want to roll that stone away. But Jesus said, roll the stone away. In a loud voice, he had called out, Lazarus, come out. The dead man had walked out of his tomb. Jesus had said to those who were standing there, unbind him and set him free. Unwrap his grave clothes. Leave them aside. Just as the disciples saw Jesus' grave clothes laying in his tomb, Lazarus was given a new life because he knew Jesus. So when Mary Magdalene stood there in that cemetery and saw Jesus himself <coughs> risen from the dead, she was probably surprised, but she shouldn't have been. She knew what God's intention is for all of us to give us all new life because we know Jesus. And surely God's intention for Jesus himself was this same new life, the firstborn of all of us. So here we are on Easter morning in 2022. On Easter in 2019, none of us could have predicted what has happened in these intervening years. All of these things that we've gone through have been surprising to us. And maybe you're even surprised here this Sunday morning. Maybe there's somebody in this sanctuary that you're surprised to be here on Easter morning because you haven't seen me in a while. And it's a happy surprise. And maybe some of you are surprised that every single time you come to church, we're singing the same hymns. Well, that might be because you're only here on Easter. I'll just make that a little fun. <laughs> there are lots of surprises in our lives, happy surprises, surprises in the news every day that make us sad and make us cry and make us wonder what will happen next. But the answer to all of our surprises, just like the answer to Mary's surprises, lies in this good news that we celebrate this morning. Because the truth of these two empty graves is that there is nothing in this world that can separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ. Not even that. Nothing is stronger than God's love for us. And in that, we have hope that overcomes every surprise. Now, I see that you celebrate birthdays, so what do we do for birthdays? <laughs> Anybody have a birthday that they're celebrating? All right. Joys and concerns, and what kinds of things would you like to share with each other today? Yes. Yeah, uh, thanks for everyone that came to the cleanup yesterday. I think it was a good success. We had quite a bit help and raise day for him to some of you do maybe three or four trips to the cemetery and dump it all so hopefully the church will get a little bit cleaner and we also need some glass at the cemetery so thanks for everybody that participated to help yes um i've been asking the congregation to pray for my friend michelle um the young who is under 30, um, her cancer, uterine cancer came back, and when they did pre-op testing, they found um, a lesion in her lung. Now, they did a PET scan, or they did a CT of the chest. There is also a mass in her spine. She has an upcoming PET scan soon, so just pray that that the lung and the spine don't light up and show that they're cancer too. Um, she really needs this. Anything else this morning? Well, let's have a moment of prayer and then we'll celebrate communion together. Let's pray. Eternal God, we thank you for all of the good gifts you give us. 
and we know that you hear all of our concerns. So we join together in a few moments of silent prayer to share those with you. We pray this Easter morning remembering all of our brothers and sisters in our faith who are in terrible circumstances this morning and cannot possibly celebrate Easter, at least in the way that they have hoped. We especially think of the people of Ukraine and people in Russia, the countries at war. We pray that you will move the hearts of those who make decisions that affect so many lives and help them to seek your leadership in their lives. We pray to the thanksgiving for all of the Christians who do worship today and celebrate this good news of resurrection. We know that in some way we are celebrating with all of them. We also know that there are other great religions who worship you in different ways who are marking this weekend as well. We pray for those who celebrate Ramadan as they fast for this month. We pray for those who celebrate Passover. We know that in all of the different ways that we have been up to worship you across the world and across the ages, that there is only one God and that ultimately we all worship you. We pray that one day you will bring us all to the table together. We pray too for Michelle as she faces so much uncertainty about her health. Give her strength and peace and calm. Bring her friends who continue to support her. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we start, I want to be sure everybody has communion elements. You were supposed to pick them up on your way down in. So uh, if you need them, I don't know, but maybe somebody can grab them.
same manner, he took the cup after supper and said, This cup is the new covenant poured out in my blood. Drink of it, all of you, in remembrance of me. Every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the death of the Lord until he comes. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Generally, we take the bread first and then the cup. All is prepared. Let us
with us all, both now and forevermore. Amen. Hey, Tim.